Hello and welcome to the Garden Warrior podcast with the Garden Warrior himself, Paul Davis. I'll be joining Paul every week with a new guest from the horticultural world as we talk the science, the theory and the practical ways to approach a garden. Known for his fun and can-do manner, Paul is one of the UK's most fun celebrity gardeners, showing you behind the scenes of his day-to-day business, punctuated by his funny stories and anecdotes, often with an insight never before seen. Hello Paul and who is your guest today? Oh, hello, Alison. Oh, well, my guest today is an old friend of mine who used to work with me in London when we both worked for a charity called Groundwork London. Uh, and we come to see him today to talk about his beekeeping. Really nice. So I want to introduce you to Mark Patterson. Hello, Mark. Hello. So what we're going to talk about today on the podcast is we're going to ask Mark a few questions and we're going to get some vibes about what he does in London. So Mark, nice. where, uh, give us an insight to what you're doing on the roofs in London and where you're working. So what I do in London is I do two things. I keep honeybees for some of my clients. So I keep bees on rooftops for a couple of clients and use the beehives as an engagement tool to introduce the, the client's staff and their visitors um, to bees. And I use the honeybees as an introduction to bees and pollinators more broadly and use them as a, as a tool to educate about the wider environmental needs of bees and what their company is doing for bees and how they can help bees at home by planting things in their gardens and making window boxes, things like that for them. And the other thing that I do is I do lots of ecological works. So I do bits of um, sort of planting, environmental improvement works, um, ecology surveys, sort of surveying wild bees to see what bees are using rooftops and using clients' gardens and things like that. And some of the green roofs, I manage them for my clients as well. So I actually do all of the management and maintenance of the roofs, so all the management of vegetation and sort of creating habitats on the roofs to, to, to attract wild bees to nest there. So some of your clients, one of them is, are we allowed to say, the mayor? Yes, so I keep bees for the City Lord Mayor at Mansion House. Um, they've got two hives on the roof in very, very fancy, elaborate, custom-made hives. And uh, the mayor harvests the honey and the honey gets given to sort of um, heads of state and business leaders and the VIPs who come visit London. That's it's a nice gift. Personalised yeah. honey yes. from your own hive. Yes, <laughs> that's and pretty nice. you also work for a very big uh, store, don't you? We've got a new restaurant opening. Yes, I also have bees on the roof of Selfridges, where they have a new uh, honey-themed concept restaurant. So all the honey gets used in the restaurant and their dishes. And um, you can sit in the restaurant and you can sort of eat your honey-themed meal and your honey cocktails and things. And you can see the honey bees that made the honey flying outside the window of the restaurant. So there's a lot of hives that we don't know about on the rooftops of London. Most people wouldn't know anything about the hives. No. Because no. as Mark will tell you, you, most people can't access them, can they? No, most, most of them are out of sight. They're on the rooftops, out of sight, out of mind. People are oblivious to the fact that they're there. But there's a lot of them around. There's about an estimated 5,000 hives in Greater London. And if, you go, if you're in the city centre, there's sort of a disproportionately high number that are in the city centre. So if, you, if you're walking through the city centre, you're not, normally not very far away from a beehive. Normally you're only a few hundred feet away from a beehive. So that's quite rare, but people don't know all the bees are around you all the time. So mm-hmm. basically, a lot of people's gardens that are in London are getting pollinated by bees that are on the rooftops. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah, it is. So there's, there's, there's lots of honeybees, and they are pollinating. They're pollinating, visiting gardens. They're visiting all the veg plots and allotments and things. They're doing lots of pollination. But there's also lots of wild bees as well. It's not just the honeybees. There's 270 odd species of bee in the UK and honeybees is just one of them. So in London we've got about half of the country's wild bees in the city as well. Um, so they're equally important as pollinators as well and some of them are actually more important as pollinators because they're more efficient at pollinating than honeybees are. So there's there's yeah lots and lots of bees everywhere. So lots of honeybee hives but there's also lots of wild bees in London. So where are we today? Can we say where we are today? Yeah so today we're in St Mary's Secret Garden which is a Horticultural Therapy Centre in Hackney, um, and I keep bees here um, for the charity. We run beekeeping courses and do beekeeping with young people with learning difficulties and emotional needs. And um, we've got um, four honeybee hives just over there in Apri. And on the other side of the garden, we've got a wild bee area where we've got lots of um, bee hotels and habitats we've created to attract wild bees. And we've got about 20, 20 odd types of wild bee that use the garden here. 
Wow. Can we talk about the uh, the hotels? Because everyone sees them on the telly for these little triangles with little holes in it. Can you just explain to us what type of bees are we going to be going in there? Yeah, so the sort of bee hotels that you see um, in garden centres and things are typically a box with bamboo sticks in them or cardboard tubes in them. And uh, they're the sort of bees that will use those tubes or leaf cutter and mason bees. And um, they're really easy to make. You can make your own. You can get some old shipping pallet wood and just saw it up and hammer it together and shove some bamboo sticks in and make your own bee hotel really, really easy to make. The ones you buy in garden centers aren't always that good because they're often quite shallow. And ideally you want a, a nesting tube that's um, about 15 centimeters long. Um, the bee hotels that I make, I make them, I make smaller size for them as well and attract lots of bees that the commercial bee hotels won't attract. So um, if you make small holes, very small holes using hollow reed stems or drilling holes into blocks of wood, you'll attract things like yellow faced bees, some of the little tiny resin bees, um, things like that, and things like that, which the, the big commercial bee hotels don't really attract because they're, 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 they're too short and they're too wide. And the majority of people wouldn't know how small these bees are, would they? So you've yeah. just shown us round here, and some of the size of the bees are like not even a centimetre long. Yeah, some of the smallest bees are only about six, six millimetres long. They're really small. And most of our bees are actually really tiny little bees. And people think they're flies, they just overlook them. So they get, they get over, over, overlooked and under-recorded. Yeah. So I know you mentioned the other day you were both looking at a bee-friendly window box or something, did you call it? Yes, bee-friendly okay, window box, yeah. yeah. Right, so what kind of things would go in that? So it depends what time of year you're planting up. I like to plant my window boxes up in the autumn. And what I do is I um, layer the window box with bulbs, spring bulbs. So you layer bulbs like lasagna. And Paul will know all about that, help you do that. Yes, yes. So you layer, layer bulbs like lasagna. And I'll put things like crocuses in, snowdrops, and then a more blander. Um, Muscari, because muscari is really good for bees. Yeah, that's yeah. very blue. It looks yeah. like there's loads of little flowers so you yeah. get hundreds of bees yeah. on muscari. Really good for like bumblebees and long tongued salty bees in spring. Um, and I'll put sort of dwarf tetrasect daffodils and things like that in as well. Um, and then, and sometimes I'll put wild little wild tulips there, dwarf tulips in. And then I'll plant things like cowslips in there. I'll put things like oregano in there. Oregano is a fantastic plant for pollinators. Attracts loads and loads of bees, but it's also probably the best garden plant that you can plant to attract butterflies. It's way better than buddleia, and yeah. you don't need loads of space like you do for a buddleia because buddleia goes to a huge, big bush. Yeah. Oregano, you can have a little patch of it in the window box and attract loads of bees and butterflies to. So, typically, plant, I'm planting sort of wildflowers in my window boxes, maritime plants, um, plants that live in sort of, you know. And you're planting for the yeah. early season because there's an early season bees. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Explain about yeah. the early, so, early bees. So, lots of bees. Um, are what you call monovoltaic, which means they come out and have one flight period a year, and some bees are bivoltaic, which means they have two flight periods a year. So the spring bees, a lot of the bees that come out in the spring are bivoltaic, they have spring generation, which come out in March, and then they're finished by about June time, and then in late summer they have another generation which emerges, and they're out till the autumn. And then you've got other bees which emerge to now in sort of early summer, and they're just out for the summer. And then, so they have one generation yet. So you have different bees coming out at different times of the year, and they all have different flower preferences and they like different things. So, if you want to plant for them in your window box, what you want to try and plant is a succession of things that are going to come up throughout the season. So you've got a succession of food, and you've got continuity of food supply for all those different types of bees that like different flowers. So Paul, you've got a client you were saying to me the other day oh. that's interested in having hives yeah. in her garden. Yeah. In terms of that, somebody setting up from scratch. Yeah, how do they set up from scratch? So say that they're getting uh, involved with a bee society or they ring someone like you and say, I'm interested in having some hives in my car. How do they start off? Like, so yeah. it really depends on whether, you know, are they wanting to be a hands-on beekeeper and actually do it themselves? Or are they just looking for someone to install some bees for them and manage them? Yeah, that's probably what um, they want to do. Yeah. So if, if, they wanted to, if they wanted to keep the bees themselves, the thing that you have to do is you really need to know, you need to understand the bees, their biology, their life cycle, how they live, and you need to be able to understand how to manage them properly. And to do that, you need to do a training course. So ideally, you would go on a training course, get mentored for a year by an experienced beekeeper, and then one, after a year or so, when you've got built up enough experience and confidence to work bees on your own, then, then look at getting your own hive. The other solution is to pay somebody to put hives there for you and look after them for you. And, and they lot, can come and manage them. Yeah. yeah, and there's lots of people. There's lots of people that people that do that. 
But one of the things you need to sort of ask yourself if you want to keep bees is why we're going to keep why do you want to keep honeybees? And a lot of people are keeping honeybees because um, they think they're saving the bees. Yeah, you told me about it, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. It's actually not the case, is it? Yeah, but honeybees aren't actually don't aren't in need of saving. Honeybees are actually the commonest bee, most widespread bee on the planet. There's 83 million managed hives um, globally. They're not threatened by extinction. They're actually increasing in numbers quite rapidly, and there's a lot of concern that sort of the increasing honeybee numbers could outcompete wild bees and put wild bees at further risk and a lot of the wild bees are already declining. So you need to ask yourself why do you want to keep bees and so saving the bees isn't really a valid reason, it's not a good idea but if you're, if you're wanting to have your own honey, if you're wanting to be able to use beekeeping as a tool, like a therapy tool like I do here at St Mary's, you know, things like that, there are lots of you know, positive and valid reasons for keeping honeybees but you need to be a bit mindful of how you do it and where you do it. I mean, that's really interesting. There's been lots in the press the last couple of years about bees and extinction and literally like aligning that with saving the planet. Yeah. So but everyone probably thinks of a honeybee as the yeah. one that's extinct, but yeah. that, as Mark just said, so where does the that honeybee come from, is like the most right. uh, frivolous bee. It's out everywhere. It's not, they're not in danger. No. It's all the other bee that Mark's talking about that we're losing and which are the ones that pollinate all the other things. So what can people do about that then? Because it's a little bit misplaced then. Yeah, people there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a sort of, um, yeah, a bit of a sort of, it's a, uh, it's a twisted narrative. Right. Which, so people you think, can definitely plant your garden yeah, up different You can plants, plant your garden up, yeah. And recent research has shown that in urban areas, you know, upwards of 85% of the nectar resources that bees rely on comes from domestic gardens, not from all the parks and gardens. It's mm. private gardens. So, you know, planting up your gardens for bees um, can have a big impact on bee populations in urban environments because your, your gardens are where bees are getting most of their food from. So better management of your gardens, not using pesticides, choosing the right types of plants that are good for bees, but also putting up bee hotels and creating nesting habitats for bees as well. Because bees need a home as well as food, and a lot of people plant for bees, but don't think about creating a home where they can nest. So around here, how many have we got of these bee hotels that you've walked by? We've, got, um, we've got about eight or nine bee hotels on the far side of the garden. And they range from sort of um, boxes filled with bamboo sticks and tubes and hollow plant stems to blocks of wood with holes filled in and we've also got some big boxes that are full of cob and cob is a, it's a mixture of straw, clay and sand all sort of mixed together yeah. in a So towny people like early in town wouldn't know what cob was though. Yeah. Cob's really something they used to use on the old buildings before we had blast and cement and bricks and all that so they used to mix it up with straw yeah. didn't they? Uh, yeah. and, and cob is a good uh, enhance of the bees because they can burrow into it. Yeah, yeah, they can brew in, they can brew into it. So, but what what cob does is it recreates a sort of natural sort of um, scarred banks and cliffs and things where a lot of these bees would naturally nest, and they can burrow into the cob. While we're talking about that, let's tell us, just tell the public what you did last week and, you, and an exact thing that we're doing in the lime rather than the cob. Before we do that, I'm going to suggest we wrap this one up. Okay. And pick that up in part two. Okay, let's do it. Sound good? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh.